Hi everybody and welcome once again to the Rock and Roll Book Club, this time for Tuesday, October 17th, 2022. This is going to be a kind of an awkward one because this is one where I have to admit, like a really bad student about to have my knuckles wrapped by the teacher that uh, I didn't finish the book before the assignment was due. And a lot of that is because I just launched a single and my time management skills are not as good as I thought they were. But a lot of it was because I am not particularly literate in rap. Um, I haven't been in Canada for most of my adult life. I haven't lived in a lot of countries where rap has been a, a big thing for most of my adult life. So I found that when I was actually going through the book, and we're talking about Bedroom Rapper, written by Raleigh Pemberton, a.k.a. Um, Cadence Weapon, I had to go back and listen to a lot of rap because I didn't understand, I, I didn't, like, I'd heard the names or maybe, you know, they were, you know, people who were, had been rapping in Edmonton way back in the day. And I had no idea who these people are, which is not that unusual. You know, I'm a 50 something white woman living in Ottawa who was in Europe for most of her adult life. So it's probably not a big surprise that I wasn't literate in it. What I wasn't quite surprised for was how much I really enjoyed a lot of it. And that is a really neat thing about this book, about Bedroom Rapper, is that there's so much to discover, especially if you're not particularly conversant in rap. There's so much to discover about rap. There's so much to discover about the world of being an independent musician. And there's so much to discover about what it's like to grow as an artist in addition to learning about rap. Raleigh Pemberton is the son of a famous or, you know, famous to Edmonton DJ, Edmonton and, and the Bronx, and grew up with music all around him. He was one of those lucky kids who always had music, always had people who were involved in music. Um, you know, his father jokes that he was, you know, both of he and his sister were conceived at after parties at one point in the book. So he never really had to discover all that much on his own until he was an adult and he went to work in different shops like HMV or at one point in time working, you know, shipping to Holt Renfrew where he was more exposed to what would be considered the typical canon of a lot of 60s, 70s rock. And what I've enjoyed about the book so far, and I'd say I'm probably about halfway through it so far, is that a lot of it is a voyage of discovery. It's about discovering who you are within a certain artistic milieu. It's about discovering what you can do and discovering what everybody else does and understanding that even though you might be really particular and really individual as an artist, there's always a way to fit in and to work with other people as well and to learn from them, even if that means having to do the typical touring thing of being in a van with six other guys and you're only making $100 a night um, it's fascinating because he, he does express regret about certain things that he did, you know, in terms of like, you know, being a 17 year old, you know, uh, record reviewer for Pitchfork, well, CD reviewer, record reviewer for Pitchfork magazine and being unnecessarily cruel to some people who probably didn't deserve it, you know, not having, you know, access or the cultural literacy within the music industry. Um, you know, for getting a, a, an entertainment lawyer, which let's face it, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily a rap thing. It's not necessarily an Edmonton thing. It's one of those mistakes that you learn as you, you're growing up and you're as a, as a musician, as an artist, as, you know, somebody who's, you know, being the, you know, the primary investor in your own business and trying to make all these things come together. Um, I once heard it said that life is the worst teacher of all because life tends to give you the exam first and then teaches you the lessons later. In this case, that's very, very much true. I'm just getting to the part of the book now where things are not going that great with um, the record company he first signed to. Um, and there are all sorts of questionable clauses and he doesn't have access. He has access to a lawyer that his mother works with, but he doesn't have access to an entertainment lawyer who can pick apart the fine, finer parts of this, you know, what a contract is and what clauses are abusive and what's fair for a record company to expect or to not expect. So all of this is, is super interesting, especially as somebody who probably will never see a record deal in her lifetime. Not that I don't want one, but let's be realistic here. Um, I'm finding that part of it really interesting as well, because you're actually getting the reading of what happens when somebody goes into this, goes into the world and doesn't, 
you know, doesn't have the same kind of support that somebody who's in Toronto might have or someone who's in New York City who, you know, having a friend who signed a record deal before might be able to look at a potential contract and say, dude, no, don't sign this. They're going to take you to the cleaners. So that's been the interesting thing. But like I said before, what I've really enjoyed about this is that it's exposed me to a whole bunch of different new songs and a whole bunch of different new artists that I probably would not necessarily have gotten into, especially because I don't have kids. You know, I don't even really have kids, you know, exposure to kids who are really literate in rap. So I can't even say to them, hey, you know what? Play me Jay Dillard's Donuts. I've never, you know, that came, album came out when I was living in Prague 22 years ago. I have no idea about Jay Dilla or didn't until I read this. So there is a lovely appendix at the back where he runs you through all the books that, or all the music that's really, really worth uh, listening to, to give you an idea. And unfortunately, I do really wish there was a, some sort of playlist with this in there because it would be really nice to be able just to go through that entire list and go and read along with the book and say, oh, that's who he's talking about. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean about the loop on that one. Or I see what you mean about this song, really taking a lot of inspiration from that song. Um, ultimately, it's about literacy. And this is the great thing is that even if you're not into rap or don't really have a lot of interest in rap yourself, it is a way of becoming really culturally literate or expanding your horizons into different aspects of rap that you might not have thought about before or you might not have been um, that exposed to because, you know, it's there. It's, you know, it's been a huge cultural force for at least 50 or 60 years now. And it's, you know, it behooves everybody to be, you know, as literate in as many musical styles as possible. So again, as a bad student, that's my, my review, review slash summary of what I've read so far of Cadence Weapons uh, Bedroom Rapper. And I apologize for not having read it all before. I am going to get through the rest of it because this is really fascinating. It's just, don't read this if you have a streaming service next to it because you'll never get through, the, it'll take you longer than you ever expected to get through the book, I swear. So here's the neat thing about uh, the way the ne this book and the next book w come together. In both um, Bedroom Rapper and do, 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 Michael Barclay's Hearts on Fire, which will be the featured book for November the 1st, we're really looking at a point where Canadian music is starting to come into its own. We've had, what, 45 years of CanCon, we've had the rules, we've had, you know, the, the, the acts that have come up, like, you know, the Ronnie Hawkinses who have come up from... Um, Arkansas and settled in Canada, you know, we've had the, the various, you know, iterations of different waves of music. This is the point where we really start to see Canadian music stake out a point of its, stake out a claim of its own and a place in the world where Canadian music can stand up on its own and it doesn't have to be the joke about, oh, well, it's Canadian, you know, why don't, what am I, how am I supposed to like it because it's Canadian? And it's interesting because on the one hand, we've got, um, bedroom rapper that expands at how this happened in Edmonton because let's face it when you think about rap centers of the world you don't necessarily think about Alberta nothing against Alberta you have some really fine musicians and some really amazing people out there but when people think about rap they don't necessarily think about Alberta so this is our rap coming up 1999 2000 2005 what's happening in Alberta and then how does it merge with what's happening in indie music in 2001 to 2005 um, in terms of broken social scene and uh, Arcade Fire, the weaker thans, the Constantines, how does this all come together and create a type of music that, or create a scene for the music, an ecosystem for the music that really allows Canadian content to thrive and be respected around the world um, to a point where it's like it's not even respected that much here in Canada. And I know, you know some of you have heard this story already, but um, I really hadn't heard a lot of metric songs until about 2018 when, God bless my friend Tora, which is, hello Tora, um, my friend Tora and her partner Des took me to see metric for my birthday that year. And I think we paid the equivalent of about 20 bucks Canadian maybe to see metric in this tiny little club in the middle of Madrid. Um, you know, not bigger, much bigger than a high school cafeteria. And then, you know, six months later, they're playing the TD Center and the tickets are well north of 80 bucks. But, you know, that whole, you know, and also Europe's easier to tour, right? Because you have so many more other big cities within a day's drive of each other. Like it's, you know, it's like a day's drive to Lisbon. It's a day's drive to Marseille. It's a day's drive to, to, to Barcelona or up to Bordeaux or something like that. So it's easier to have a more, to, to make money out of that ecosystem because it is so much more compact and it doesn't require that much of a capital outlay. Anyway, 
that's getting into the territory of all the stuff that we're going to cover on November 1st with, again, Hearts on Fire by Michael, by, by Michael Barkley. Uh, Six Years of Cana Change Canadian Music, 2000-2005, which is the companion volume to Have Not Been the Same, which covers the scene from about 1992 to 2000. So if you're looking for bands like Sloan, that's in the previous book, Have Not Been the Same. So just a couple of quick notes before we wrap up. Thank you so much to everybody who has streamed the, the single so far. We are now up to 3,500 streams and I'm thrilled to bits about it. I can't believe somebody's actually, people have wanted to listen to it 3,500 times, but I'm grateful that you did. Um, next, th actually the next version of Rock and Roll Book Club will be pre-recorded and then sent live here on Facebook Live because the Tuesday, November 1st, I'm going to be playing as the featured artist at Live on Elgin here in Ottawa, debuting a whole bunch of new songs, including the new Christmas song, which is called, if you haven't heard it, it is called, I'll Have a Merry Christmas Even If It Kills Me, which pretty much sums up how I feel about Christmas. And um, yeah, so come on out November 1st, Live on Elgin, that's just so Elgin, just south of Nepean Street on the number four, five and 14 bus routes. It's free to get in, it's free to play. So if you do play an instrument, please bring it along. There's a piano there for your use if you like. And come out and check out some of all these talents because you know what? You could pay 500 bucks to see Blink, 80, Blink 182 or whoever the hell, but why not come out and see the stars of, the tom of tomorrow? And then you can say that you knew them when, or you can say that you knew them way back when. So thanks again for your time and attention. Read on, rock on, and we'll see you back here in two weeks. Take care. Bye-bye.